Uh, my name is Jay Baloli. Uh, I'm currently working on an exhibition for the Williamson Gallery called Mars Astronomy and Culture. Uh, I basically organize exhibitions of space photography, or if you will, astronomical photography for about 25 years. And uh, that all happened because I came to run a gallery at Caltech uh, when they had an art gallery called the Baxter Art Gallery. And it was very important there to basically focus on the interrelationship between uh, art and science, art and technology. And in fact, uh, that led to um, two projects with uh, the, uh, the mother and father of art about the environment, Una Helen Harrison, a wonderful artist who basically made sculpture with light, not with uh, you know, solid material in the Moroccan Krebs. And the last exhibition I did at that gallery before it closed was called uh, 25 Years of Space Photography. It was about the photographic history of JPL. And uh, that was actually encouraged by the work of an artist. There was a wonderful painter and sculptor named Nancy Graves, and she did a whole series of paintings based on uh, JPL's uh, spacecraft that went to the moon and also an early spacecraft that went to Mars. So um, one of the exhibitions was started uh, at, um, at the Baxter Art Gallery when it existed. Uh, the latest exhibition was the History of Space Photography, which was here at the Williams Gallery several years ago, in, I think 2012, Steve? I can't remember exactly. Uh, and this, this is the current exhibition, and it suddenly occurred to me that basically I was just focusing on photography. I wasn't really thinking about the complex exploration of a planet. So that is what this show is about, and what it is also about, the reason the show is called Mars Astronomy and Culture, is because in the late 19th century, as I'll go into, uh, Mars became not just about science, uh, not, not just about astronomy, it became part of popular culture. So this is some of the earlier, I can't show you everything in the show because there'll be 100 images or objects in the show, this is one of the earlier images, which is uh, one of the great astronomers, William Herschel, who did a lot of work at Mars in the late 18th century. The earliest drawings by an astronomer that um, are legible uh, is from 1687 by a Dutch astronomer named Christian Huygens. And unfortunately, getting that image is really tough. I'm trying to get it from uh, the Netherlands, which is where it is. But these are more available. As the 19th century continued, there was more elaborate telescopes and more elaborate exploration of Mars by astronomers. This is Giovanni Schiaparelli, who basically studied Mars for literally about 13 years and came up with drawings as complex as this. And again, the quality of telescopes was still not that great. And so basically, this is somebody looking through a telescope trying to figure out with all the motion of the air on this planet, what he is seeing. But what you can start seeing is there were things that he thought he saw, which he called canali, which is, when you translate it from Italian, channels. And then happened is an American astronomer, Percival Lowell, who had his observatory in uh, Arizona, thought that there were he translated it directly from canali to canals, which is an incorrect translation. And he started seeing canals on Mars, which implied either an existing or a past civilization, which obviously went and hit the international press, as you might suspect. I'll get back to culture in a second because that last drawing is really key to the development of, of culture with Mars. But basically, even with uh, the early telescopes at Mount Wilson, you can see how rough uh, even a photograph of Mars would be uh, in 1909. This is from the Carnegie Observatories. Uh, the fact of the matter is it took decades to disprove 
uh, Professor Lowell's idea that there were actually canals on Mars and therefore either a past or present civilization. And even when you get to Palomar, uh, again, the images are not that great. We get carved into the tourists. Finally, uh, and obviously, the bulk of this exhibition comes from JPL. And in fact, uh, on this exhibition, I've had two advisors. One, uh, the late Yuri Vanderwood, who was uh, the person in the public information office who worked with the scientist to decide what distributed to the world press in terms of images, what was considered the most important scientifically to be in the world press, and also a uh, uh, executive at JPL, uh, uh, Randy Wesson, who is now my current advisor for the show. But what you have when you start with JPL is, of course, really looking at the um, at Mars. And what happens is, as you go through the study of Mars by JPL, there's the expectation that whatever you see, it's going to look like our planet. And of course, it doesn't. And so up at the top, you can see a little bit of a cloud. Um, in the first image, they eliminated the cloud because there could be clouds on Mars. Uh, there is an image, the last image, I, I gotta go back to it, was so slow that basically at JPL, they took colored pencils and did a drawing which was faster than this information coming in from space uh, on this, from the spacecraft. Uh, again, they kept sending spacecraft to Mars. This is uh, all the images they got from Mariner 6 and 7, which start showing the whole planet. And then with Mariner 9, which basically revolved around the planet, and they were able to see the entire planet. This is the uh, biggest volcano in the solar system, 8,000 feet high. And you start seeing other major things that they couldn't see before. Valles Marineris uh, is the, the largest canyon in the solar system, as far as we know. Uh, 2,500 miles would be like a canyon from New York to LA. And then finally, there are Viking landers. Uh, again, you can see the time passing between 64 and 76. Um, I don't have an image of what happened, but basically, again, they thought that it was Mars, that the sky would be blue. And so the first image that came out was blue. But of course, the reality is Mars sky is very, very different. The atmosphere is very, very, uh, very, very narrow. And uh, the American flag was doctored, this image. Uh, so the American public would think that basically the JPL sciences at least could take a photograph that showed the American flag as it was on Mars. It would probably be green and brown. <laughs> then you get images that basically show how thin the atmosphere is. Uh, as my science advisor tells me, uh, if you stand on the, on the equator of Mars, your feet may be 70 degrees, your head would be below zero because the atmosphere is so, is so narrow. Again, another image showing, uh, showing Dallas Marineris and the extent of it. And then basically, and this is obviously not, you know, a camera out there saying, hold it. Uh, this is a, a, co a combination of other images uh, to show the entire half of, uh, of Mars, the hemisphere of Mars. Uh, I actually could only get this image from the German Space Agency. It wasn't in existence in the United States. And then with the Hubble Space Telescope, basically to spread Mars out, like a traditional uh, map of the of the of uh, you know, our planet to see the entire thing. Uh, again, in terms of how Mars works, uh, it is not a sandstorm as it might be in Phoenix, Arizona. It is a dust storm, and so what you have, um, they basically, uh, you know, were trying to look at Mars. There was a dust storm that went on for several months, which is can happen on Mars. Uh, that basically, as other landers occur, uh, you get both what it is, how it comes down with, and this is 
countless balloons and uh, again, the Martian sky in terms of what it really looks like. Uh, what was interesting is that basically they did a number of 3D images of Mars, not just because it was cool and you could put on the glasses and see it, but it was a way of negotiating in space where the spacecraft could go without bumping into a rock or being turned over by a rock or something like that. And that basically, as you get into later, uh, into later um, landers, this is an opportunity, they start finding a number of, of spheral, spher, excuse me, cereals, which basically start implying in a very direct way the existence of water. And what is so interesting is that basically, as you go Mars rover or Mars orbiter by Mars orbiter, you find out more and more in terms of the existence of water on Mars. Uh, again, some of the great images. Again, obviously you can see that this is a combination of various images being sent back. Uh, this is basically uh, with uh, the Spirit in Hab and Drill, and the Drill into the surface. This is one of the new drill sites. What is fascinating, even with the SUV Curiosity rover, which is going around now, uh, they can only drill into Mars one centimeter. This is not going to tell you a whole lot about what's underneath the surface. There are dust devils on Mars. Uh, you can't do an exhibition like this without at least having one sunset. <laughs> and so there it is, the sunset on Mars. And that basically they start seeing flows where there's something, where there's something else. And basically, uh, I, you know, as I said at this point, um, the idea that it would be something behave like liquid water. Again, the science has gone very, very quickly. And um, this is they use infrared information to get minerals, carbonate. Um, it's not carbonate form, but dissolved waters. Uh, so there's more and more uh, proof as it goes along. Uh, we're already in 2008 here, less than 10 years ago, about the existence of water. And then basically, this is carbon dioxide ice eroded, easing terrains, uh, going from ice to vapor, which of course is what frozen carbon dioxide does. And then also, they start having much more abilities on the spacecraft to really figure out what is on the Martian surface. And these are hydrated animal. Um, Minerals are recording the presence of water. Uh, you can start seeing as they go along. And this is from the European Space Agency how extensive the uh, possibility and the existence of water is on Mars. Uh, again, there are moons, uh, Deimos, Phobos, really kind of capture things from, your, uh, from uh, the belt between Mars and Jupiter. Then basically, frost in uh, in craters, uh, and basically, again, the fact that there is not just frozen um, frozen carbon dioxide, but also frozen water at various latitudes. Okay, and then finally, as we're getting toward Curiosity, the proof of the ephemeral existence of water, because they can see sandstone, which only exists in the presence of water. Conglomerate, again, conglomerate can only exist in the presence of water. And then alluvial fans, again, water coming out of mountains. So as you're getting into this later period, we're only about five years ago, you're getting that. And again, or images of fluid moon, uh, again, uh, things that are flowing down um, and uh, it's, in this case, it's not clear that it's water. Uh, in this case, it is clear that it's water, including hydrated salts. And 
that basically, as you get into recent past, they start being able to tell the gravity on Mars. Mars has, unlike the Earth, has no, um, uh, nothing to protect the planet from, uh, from solar flares. There's nothing. Mars is completely solid. There's no fluid cores. There's only Earth, uh, which creates a protection for our planet. In Mars, that is gone. And so gravity is obviously where the big, uh, where the big, um, by and large, where the big volcanoes are. And then there's crystal thickness. Mars is thicker in one hemisphere, the lower hemisphere, than it is in the upper hemisphere. Again, um, minerals that communicate with a volcano erupted beneath ice. All of this is happening very, very quickly. And let's look at um, uh, our great SUV on Mars, the Curiosity rover. Um, our ice age, um, the results that we put as models, a glacial period ending about 400,000 years ago. That's not very long in terms of history on Mars. And then this is basically, there is Mount Sharp in the distance. This is, uh, you can see part of the rover, uh, uh, the Curiosity rover showing itself. Uh, this is uh, just a magical photograph. And that, of course, is its goal, Mount Sharp. These rovers move very, very, very slowly. This is not something at 25 miles an hour speed limit. They move very, very slowly because there are so many rocks and things to fall into. Well, here we are with culture. The fact of the matter is um, there was a journalist in, um, in England named H.G. Wells. He obviously was aware of recent things occurring in the press. And uh, Percival Wells' first book came out in on 1896, 1899, the first great science fiction book about Mars comes out, War of the Worlds, uh, which actually refers directly to Schiaparelli's exploration or exploration as a, uh, as a uh, astronomer of Mars. And then basically, science fiction about Mars takes off. Edgar Rice Burroughs basically did three volumes uh, on, on Mars uh, science fiction. Uh, you've got Ray Bradbury. Uh, and, uh, and it's interesting that basically scientists like Carl Sagan acknowledge that Burroughs' Mars tales were the wellspring from which uh, his own career rose. Uh, the War of the Worlds episode. Uh, War of the Worlds keeps coming back as a theme here, the radio drama. Uh, it was, as I found out, which I didn't realize, he performed it as a ghost story on Halloween, mm -hmm. a kind of typical Orson Welles thing. Mm -hmm. And then the great Ray Bradbury book, The Martian Chronicles, uh, Stranger in a Stranger Land by Robert Heinlein. And then, interestingly, after the spacecraft start coming out from JPL to go to Mars, it inspires another generation of science fiction writers. Dean Stanley Robinson, Red Mars, Blue Mars, Green Mars, uh, a whole new generation of writers becomes inspired by Mars, in this case, by the science. What also happens is as soon as Mars becomes part of popular culture, there are articles in the popular press all the time. And in fact, there'll be a couple articles in the show from popular science from about 1909. And then basically, again, War of the Worlds comes back um, during the period when uh, really we thought the end of the world was near because of the threat of atomic war. It is not surprising that great science fiction movies about attack come in, uh, in, uh, in the 1950s, but of course, uh, uh, the original War of the Worlds is set in England. Uh, obviously, the film is set in the with the destruction of Los Angeles. Uh, a good early dystopian Los Angeles film. Uh, Wooten County Menzies, one of the great, uh, basically, art directors of, of films, basically creating many, many environments for many films. 
uh, does his only film, Invaders from Mars, 1953. A movie set on Mars with a former governor of the state. <laughs> and then basically, uh, The Martian, uh, directed by Ridley Scott, the most recent movie based on the novel, uh, basically set on Mars. So what is interesting about this show and so different from the other shows I worked on is basically the connection between science and basically the exploration of Mars and basically what has happened in popular culture. And um, that's all I have to say. I'm open to questions. Thank you.